Now, welcome friends to this afternoon session of our monthly meetings. In the morning, I said to you that what I was sharing with you about the need to feel that you are behind the eyes, not look for it, but be behind the eyes as a beginning of good meditation. I said that the easy part. I kept on telling more easy parts. Now to tell you the difficult part. The difficult part is to be ready to receive that love. That's the difficult part. The difficult part is not to do meditation. People have succeeded with time and patience. They have succeeded. They have had some internal spectacular visions also. They have been able to withdraw their attention from the body and have other experiences of flying into different spaces. But to be able to receive that love and not close the door is the difficult part. And why is it difficult? Because the very equipment given to us to help us in a certain way is being misused to stop love from flowing within us. That equipment is called our human mind. The human mind was given to us for a very specific purpose. First, to have an experience of universes in time and space, like this physical universe. Secondly, to be able to think in that space, in that time. And to be able to communicate, to be able to be in touch with everything else in the universes we create. To be able to write, to be able to speak, to be able to express beautiful functions. Mind performs all these functions and they are all beautiful. It was not supposed to obstruct us from ourselves. So what we did is that we somehow did not make the proper use of the mind and in inverted it to stop us from ourselves. And how does it do? With something that was supposed to be a positive thing in the mind, we made it into a negative thing. The positive thing in the mind was, don't accept anything with blind faith. Keep your skepticism. Keep questioning. Don't be vulnerable to negative forces you will encounter in this universe and just accept what they say. Check them out. Have doubts every time when something comes up and clear your doubt before moving forward. It's a great gift given to us to screen something that comes to us because of so much negativity which was placed along with positivity in this created universe. We use the very thing which was skepticism in order not to be fooled by anybody or any negative entity. We use it to protect ourselves from ourselves. We try to protect our own self, which is our soul, from ourself through the mind. Now that was not a good use of the equipment we got. You know, any equipment you get can be used for positive reasons or negative. Even nuclear power is today serving the needs of nuclear producing nations all over the world. And yet, nuclear bombs were made with the same power. And so much destruction took place with nuclear weapons. Everything can be misused also. We have, as a human race, been misusing a beautiful equipment given to us called our mind and used it not to create skepticism against something that might come and hurt us. We use skepticism to prevent love from flowing within ourselves. We think too much. We need to think what we need to think. Have you ever thought like this, that I have got a thinking machine in me and I should think what I want to think? Do I have to think something unnecessarily? No, we think unnecessarily. We think bizarre things. We keep on thinking. We think endlessly without knowing what we are thinking. And we think ourselves out of love, out of our own self. We think too much. Like other machines we use, we should use our machine of mind when we want to think and tell the mind what to think. Give it the title, subject, now you concentrate on this subject. If we were able to do that, we would make very good use of our mind. 
we would think, okay, my thought is to go there, my thought is to stay here, my thought is to concentrate here, I am going to do that, the whole mind will cooperate. But if you say, mind, what shall I do? It is bound to take you outside. It designed for that. It was designed to get you also the experiences of a created world. So that is why this whole thing, the difficult part, is the mind. And all meditators know that the difficult part is the mind because when they try to meditate on the self, the mind drives them out. The mind attaches to experiences. Mind tries to make those things its own which can never become its own. Mind tries to collect physical worldly things, objects, and make them a possession. This is my house, my car, I'm going to get another car, I'm going to buy another house, I'm going to have more jewelry, I'm going to have more of clothes, I'm going to have more of this stuff. And you try to make all of them for a physical body that's very short-lived. When people die with all that stuff that they've collected, what do you think they feel? Oh, I did so much for all this, nothing is going with me. No, no, I don't want to leave it. And by saying that, they come again and again and again for the very things they are attached to. And the prison house becomes a permanent prison house of coming back again and again. Attachment to things that are never going to go with you. Then we get attached to people, family, friends, my children, my parents, my friends, my so-and-so. We get attached to so many people. None of them go with us when we die. At that time, we say, oh, I couldn't do that. I wish I had done that. So many friends come to me and they are carrying such a heavy guilt that they could not take care of their mother, father, brother, sister, son, child, somebody, which they could have done, but they died. They were about to die. They're so worried about it. Those people died whom they were going to take care, could not take care of. They carry a guilt. What does that guilt do? The guilt brings you back again and again to the same relationships. We have collected so much guilt. It's unbelievable. We do things and we divide it into good and bad. That's the function of the mind also. Mind has a certain corner set apart in our mechanism, in our conscious mechanism called conscience. Conscience is which tells us, no, it's wrong. Don't do this. And we still do it because it's pleasurable, because we like it. And the conscience is, no. And then we say, we committed sin, now we are guilty. And we carry the guilt for life. We can't get over it. See how much prison we are making around ourselves, how many uh, strings we are tying ourselves with. And these are the difficult parts to take care of in our journey towards the spiritual goals. These don't go easily. People say, now I am on a spiritual path, I am going to detach myself. Has anybody ever detached by trying to detach? I've never seen anybody. The more they try to detach, the more attached they get. I give an example of my own case. I came here, I found Yeo Shaky's pizza, and I loved it. I got attached to it. I said, this is wrong, I should not be attached to a pizza. So I said, no more pizza, no more pizza. The more I said, the more I saw Shaky's pizza in front of me. I dreamt of Shaky's pizza. Therefore, you cannot fight attachment by trying to practice detachment. There is no such thing as practicing detachment. Therefore, how, but we are, de, we are attached. We have to be detached. If we cannot practice detachment, what's the way to get rid of this attachment? The answer lies within attachment. When we are attached to something, supposing I like a particular kind of pizza and I find a better one and I start eating the better one, after a while, I'll be attached to the new one, I'll forget the old one. Only an attachment can create detachment, not the practice of detachment. You get attached to something else. And on the spiritual journey, if you get attached inside to something, you are detached automatically over time with everything outside. So the best thing is to be attached to something inside. And it's not easy. How do you attach? You don't, don't normally practice attachment. You get attached because you're pulled. Again, it's the same thing. Love is playing another role here of pulling you into attachments. And we also call it love. We feel it's love. We attach. We don't say we are attached to you. We say we love you. 
We love our children, we love our property, we love our house, we love everything. And that's also a pull outside. How can you compensate all this by love inside? Not easy. But a perfect living master makes it easy. As I said, the perfect living master is only an image outside, he is in reality inside. When you perform this simple function of imagining yourself there and becoming unaware of this body, you will have a flight inside, an experience of a flight inside in the space you create inside, where you will see the perfect living master who initiates you or accepts you outside, he'll be there. You will see him. See the same form as you see him outside for recognition purposes. After that, both of you can change forms in the inner experiences. When you see that perfect living master whose unconditional love you already experience outside, inside, it pulls you with a love that makes all attachments become detachments. That's the way detachment comes, by an attachment inside. So this is not easily accepted by the mind. The mind still wants to run outside. So most of the battle people are fighting on a spiritual path is a battle with their own mind. They are trying to find a battle with the attachments of the mind and trying to go within with their effort which doesn't work. The mind is not making them receptive to the love that is flowing. Therefore, if you want to make your meditation effective and want to take the advantage of the best feature of good meditation, which is being pulled by the love, unconditional love of a master beyond the mind. If you want to make that, start your meditation with your own best experience of love and devotion. Meditation is never successful for true spirituality except when done from stage one with love and devotion. But that's the key. If you can develop love and devotion or be pulled by the love and devotion that's already coming to you, the love that's coming to you. By the way, when I use this phrase love and devotion, it's a way of saying that love comes to us. We don't do love. We don't make love. We don't create love. We respond to love. True love is something that touches us and we respond. The response is called devotion. When love touches us, our response is so beautiful. It's called devotion. We become devoted. So that is why love and devotion go together. When you have that experience and you can hold on to that experience while doing everything else in meditation, your progress is rapid, the detachment is easier and you are able to remember that mind is not your ultimate goal but love which comes from the soul is your ultimate goal. So that's why you can transcend all this and go above. The practical solution is that since we don't know how to love any, anybody, we try to love and we, it's an ego trip. You know, when we say, I love you, when a person says this, I be, become very alert. Let me now see what's going to happen. A person is telling, A is telling B, I love you. Then I wait what happens. There's true love going on here. And B says, but I don't care for you. Then A says, I also hate you then. I see the drama. He may say the same day, may say the next day, may say in three months. People come to me for blessings. We found our soulmate. We found, a man comes and says, I found this girl, she is my soulmate. From day one we knew we are made for each other. Everything tallies and we have checked it out. We'll be together forever. We love each other deeply. After three months the same couple come, we are in divorce court. Now what happened? From day one we knew we are not made for each other. I said that's not what you said on day one. But this is what happens. Because when we are saying, imagine a person saying, I love you. What does the mind say? Mind says, I am doing something for you. I, ego, my ego is willing to yield something for you. It's an ego trip. It is, it, it is responding only if you respond further in the same terms. And if you don't, it's, it's a disappointment to the ego, it ends. So that is not when you use too many words. When some people sit and say, I love you, I love you too much, I get very doubtful. 
if that will last too long. They, they are talking too much. They are thinking too much. True love, when it pulls, you become speechless. You can't speak. Words don't come from your mouth. You don't know what to say. Because it's something different. When you love somebody, you're not thinking what I am doing. You think, how wonderful I've met this person. This person is everything for me. You think of that person, not yourself. In studying people's <laughs> behavior, I find most of our actions are ego-based. Ego originated. Most of our actions in this life are, I do this, I can do this, I have done this. It's always I, I, I. The face of the ego, this is the face of the mind, by the way. Ego is the face of the mind. The thinking process brings up the I in front. And we keep on saying, I have done this, I do this, I love you, I will do this for you. It's all I. The only time when I have seen that I disappear is when one has real experience of love, when the beloved is everything. And think of the beloved and not yourself, not I. I disappears. Love is the only experience, even in physical life, that I have seen, which can put the ego at a backbencher. Otherwise, ego is always in front of you in everything that you do. So the, the true love that we get from a perfect living master and the devotion that we get out of it is such a great help to us from day one. Not necessarily wait till you go to the end of the causal plane and then say, now I want to cross the mind and now I need love. No, start from day one. Because otherwise, the journey is so long, it can take several lifetimes. But if you want to do it in one lifetime, then the key is, Keep the secret in mind, the ultimate, ultimate thing that will cause, I don't know, I can't call it thing, ultimate pull that causes you to go into a true home is love. True love, pure love, love that does not come from the mind at all, the love that is not sullied by the mind, love that comes from the soul. Relationship of a perfect living master with us is relationship of soul to soul. When we go, go in the human body before a human body of a perfect living master, we think maybe he is looking at us and judging what we look like, what we dress like, what we speak like. He is not doing any of these things. He is looking how much baggage we have gathered on our minds, how many attachments we are carrying at that time, how ready are we to, get, to leave them behind. What is our readiness to say we are done with this and we want to move on? He looks at that. He looks at the yearning of the soul hidden behind these things. And he has come to take the soul out of this snare of this baggage that we are carrying. We carry so much baggage with us, not from one lifetime, from several lifetimes. We did not come here for several lifetimes anyway. Do you know, people ask me this question, if this was such a messy place, why did we come here at all in the first place? We did not come with this intention. We came with the intention of having a different experience, a totally different experience in time and space, not the one we were having earlier, which was total, but spread it out into segments and create segments by time and space and have these experiences of different universes, including this physical universe, enjoy it and see how it works, ups and downs, see the law of opposites, see duality, see how duality functions and be participant in it and create a world of beings, especially human beings and other beings and we sit in one of the human beings we create and watch from there. Great idea, great plan and we executed the plan very well and came here for one life in order to have this experience and sit in one of the characters of the play we created. We were, the, we were all of them. We created all, but decided to sit in one of them so we can watch, not from an external audience point of view, but from within the drama, from within the show, we sat in the head of one of these characters that we created. Having done that, we said, now we watch the show. It's over, we'll go home. But in creating the drama, we made certain provisions. 
because we had created time and space to place the drama in, we created the law of cause and effect to create the effects here. The cause of law and effect. That means for every event we put on this timeline, created timeline, there should be a cause. So we made causes for the events we placed in the one life we came for. All events we place there must have a cause in some notional earlier life, which we never lived. We place the causes in a past life that we never lived. And we began to live this life and made that past life real in order to have the effect of it real now. Once the past life, which was not real, this life became real for us and we got attached to things in the play. We got so attached, we said we want to stay here longer. The human body was not designed for that. So we began to come reincarnation again and again and made the past lives also real. And we got caught. We got caught in so much stuff. We got caught in the very law of cause and effect that we created in order to enjoy these events. We made it into law of karma that if you do anything now which is not good according to your conscience, you will be punished. If you do something which is good, you'll be rewarded. Punishment and reward were built into the system and built not only for physical experience, even astral experience, even causal mental experiences, they were built into us. And a very strong, powerful law came into being just for having an experience here called the law of karma by which we determined through our conscience, this is good, this is bad. And we kept on changing what was good and what was bad, as we proceeded from one lifetime to another, from one scene to another in this everlasting drama, we kept on changing what is good and bad and made that part of our conscience and created societies outside of ourselves to tell us what is good and what is bad. We created institutions outside of ourselves as part of the play, religions outside of ourselves to tell us what is good and what is bad and built it up and created a continuous flow of events on an extended timeline, lifetime after lifetime. This was not the purpose of our visit here into this experience at all. But we got trapped. Fortunately, we were aware that this can happen. Obviously, we were totality, we were consciousness. When we made a plan, we were aware that the plan can create this experience. So we made a counter plan to be able to get out of it when we want to. We won't know how to get out because we, we will think we'll do good things and we'll get out. No, we'll keep on getting rewarded in the same place. We'll do bad things, maybe they'll kick us out. No, you'll get punished right in the same place, in these three levels. All this is happening in three levels of physical, dream world, physical world, astral world, causal world, these four levels that we are ordinarily experiencing. We can be punished and rewarded in all these four. We can be punished or rewarded. We can pay off our karma in the dream state, in the wakeful state, wakeful physical state, in the astral state, in the causal state. All mental states are fit for paying off karma, which is held in any case on the mind. There's no karma anywhere else except on the mind. That's where the timeline is drawn. But instead of that, we continue to make, because of the joy and pleasure enjoying these experiences and then feeling guilt about them, we perpetuated ourselves. How did we make arrangements as intelligence, as super intelligence in totality of consciousness? How did we make arrangement to get out of this, which looks like almost impossible to get out? We made arrangements that when we are really fed up, the soul, not the mind, not the body, when the soul is really fed up and says, I have had enough, I want to go back home. When it says that, we will get something from that very place which is our true home and that will pull us up, take us back. That very thing is called the perfect living master in our experience. That's the arrangement we made. When we are ready, the perfect living master appears in our life and takes us back home. This is our own arrangement. So that is why, what is the secret to go back home. Single secret. 
seek from the soul. Seek from your inmost self. Seek and you will find. Seek and you will go home. Seeking is the only secret. Seeking from the inmost self that not even the mind can defy. Some elderly people come to me and they come and see me for the first time. They have never heard anything like this before. And they have an interview, personal time with me. In the interview they say, what you are telling today, I've been seeking all my life. I said, have you ever told anybody? No, there was nobody to tell. But today I know this is what I was seeking. Seeking is there. It is seeking that leads you. And seeking coupled with not creating more unnecessary entanglement as far as you can. We've already got a lot of entanglement. Now, when I say entanglement, what is this entanglement means? Already having created causes, which means having done actions or mental actions or intentions already done, which you are holding on to your mind, which are bound to have a repercussion and bound to create reward or punishment. That is, that is what we hold on and that's what's perpetuating our coming back again and again. Where are those held? Where are those actions of ours, our karmas, held? They are held in our mind. They are created in our mind. They are held in our mind. Karma is always in the mind. There is no karma on the body. Body just carries out what is in the mind. There is no karma on our sense perceptions. They are just activities of the mind. Mind carries karma. Mind pays off karma. Mind creates karma and the burden is always carried on the mind. Mind is not as short-lived as our body. Our physical body lives, what, 80, 100, 120 years, not even that much. Sometimes most people die, some people will live longer later. But it's just a small number compared to the life of the sensory perceptions, our imaginative self, our astral self, which lasts thousands of years or physical years unlike the mind which lasts millions of physical years, one mind. So one mind can carry so much stuff. Of course it is also born and also dies because it is in the time frame. But one mind can carry so much stuff for so long. And all that cumulatively is affecting us. When we say my destiny is made up of my own karma, there are two parts of it. One, what has come to me as my destiny that means where I will be born, who will be my parents, where I will move, where I will meet friends, where will I be kicked out, where will I have accidents, where will I get married, where will I not do this. All those events of life are one set of karma which are created by events that took place earlier and these are punishment and reward for those actions. These can be all good or these can be all bad or the mixture. Supposing they are all good, supposing all the things you did in a past life were all good, you won't be here. You will be destined to be in a beautiful place called a heaven in the astral plane. You deserve it. Supposing you do all bad things, you won't be here. You will be in a terrible place in the astral plane which is called hell. Hell and <laughs> those, are, those are not in the physical world. Sometimes we make them in the physical world also. We can make our own life hell here and our own life heaven here. That's generally for short periods and it's not so common. But the other hell and heaven are long-term rewards and punishments. But supposing you have a life in which you have done some good and some bad, you become human. Human life is never perfect that everything is good or everything is bad. It's a mixture. The ups and downs create a human life. Some people complain, why do I have such bad karma? I say, thank God you had some bad karma and you became human and got a chance to seek and go home. Otherwise you will never get the chance. This is a good thing that we have a combination of good and bad and that's how the karma has created our human self and we can now escape by seeking. Why can't we seek when we are an angel or we are up in heaven? because we have no free will there. How come we have no free will there? We can have free will here. 
heaven is supposed to be much better than there. Can't we decide something? No, you can't decide there because you already know what you're going to do. You know the whole future. Supposing here we come to know the whole future, do you know free will will disappear? Free will is only in ignorance. Free will exists only in ignorance. When you don't know what's going to happen, you're free will. If you knew what's going to happen, you can't change it. You'll go exactly according to that plan. It'll be like going like a robot. We have been made ignorant of the future, so we have a great feeling. I have free will. I can decide whatever I like. And yet when you go to the next level, you'll find whatever you thought you would decide was already decided. You only thought you were deciding now. So free will is just an experience. And only here. It's not in any other form of life. In our Indian scriptures, they record 8.4 million, Chirasi lakh, 8.4 million forms of life, life derived from the same soul, the same identical soul can be in 8.4 forms of life, out of which 5.4 million is in the plant and other kingdom. And the rest, the human being comes in the last four hundred thousand in that list, and in that all the heavenly beings, even gods running out universes at different levels are included. So they are all forms of the same soul creating different forms. That's a very comprehensive list. But out of 8.4 million forms of life that a soul can take, only one form can have this experience of free will because of ignorance and that is human form. It's amazing. But that's good enough that we can be human at some point and go back home by what we think is free will. Now why is free will necessary in order to be able to go home? Because free will gives us the experience of seeking. Seeking is a voluntary act. I seek. You can't seek if you know I'm already seeking. The seeking is an experience created by ignorance of the future. And that seeking is what the key is to get out of here. So it's very well placed. The ignorance and knowledge is placed very well. So when we are able to transcend by seeking, then we discover that the whole thing was pre-planned. But even the thinking that we are making decisions were pre-planned. People ask me question, if everything is pre-planned, why do I have to do anything? No, you don't have to do anything. That's also pre-planned. You're asking this question is pre-planned. If everything is from one source, one origin, one totality of consciousness, where the whole pre-planning has taken place, we are all part of that. I can't just get out of it just because that's part of the play. It's part of the play to question, it's part of the play to think, it's part of the play to uh, feel that I'm making choices now. If we go back home, we find this is all part of a drama in which we as authors participated. Not only as actors, we're not actors, we're the authors of our own show. So that's a, again another question that people ask. If everything is pre-planned, why am I responsible for my karma? You are responsible for you, pre you pre-wrote it, period. Nobody else wrote it. Okay, the previous life you led, you thought you led it. Now you think you are leading it now. So it's obviously your responsibility. Pre-written pre does not mean pre-written here. We are not pre-writing here. We are pre-writing by our actions, which are part of the law of karma on our mind. We are pre-writing here by our karma, and that then takes effect, and we have cause, cause and effect going on, and we get rewards and punishments. But the true pre-written was from the origin. This is a very interesting thing. Somebody comes to me and says, my karma is very bad, I am getting bad health, and I suffered so much, and I went to my a guru, I went to a master, I went to a psychic, I went to somebody. And he healed me by his spiritual powers. He altered my destiny. Did it happen? Yes, it did happen. That means what was pre-written was not really so solidly pre-written that somebody could, divine intervention could, by somebody, alter it. So he questions. You say everything is pre-written. No, that man changed the pre-written thing. I said, that's wonderful. 
that you had this great experience of change of destiny by another human being. Now just go one step higher to the astral plane and check out what happened. You go to astral plane, the divine intervention and change of destiny was already predetermined. That this change will take place was predetermined, which could not be seen here. Okay, we go to higher master now, who can change even at that level. So we go to a still higher, more enlightened person. And he says, I can even change that, what is predetermined, what you notice. And he changes it. He says, wow, that, that predetermined was wrong. I mean, it can be changed. So he says, go one step further in the causal plane. In the cause where the life forms are made up, both the interventions are predetermined. Before we were ever born here, they were bo both predetermined. That the intervention will change it, whether it's predetermined or not. At the higher level, it was predetermined. Somebody comes and says, he is going to change even that. All right, he changes even what is in the Akashic records, in the, in the causal plane. He changes the Akashic records for us. Wow, then he can change something. There is not, nothing is solidly written. They go up higher a little bit. Go to your true home, such cunt, true home. You find even the Akashic record, change of Akashic record was pre-written. At the top, everything is pre-written. As you come down, it looks like interventions are taking place, making changes. So it depends when you say, is destiny already pre-written? Depends where you are talking from. At each level, you can see changes, but at some point they are pre-written. If you go to the top, everything is pre-written beforehand, before time and space were created. And it's all a play from there. It's from the one origin. It's not from many. There were no two. There was only one when the whole show was pre-written. It still is one. And the whole show is taking place within the consciousness of the one. Nothing is outside. It's still inside. Inside one consciousness, the whole play is taking place of all levels of creation. And that one totality itself, as it is now we are sitting here, is inside the head of each one of us. That's the greatest miracle. <laughs> greatest miracle, the totality of everything that has ever been created. The creator himself and all creation are sitting right inside our head and can be accessed when we are human beings. What can be most miraculous or wonderful? And we have the means. We have guides and teachers coming and telling us how to do it, how to access it. And we have experience of their love and their beautiful, unconditional love for us, which pulls us to those levels of experiences. What else could we ask for? What else can a soul ask for except to be met by a soul that's part of it and pulls it to oneness, the truth, the ultimate reality? In the process of being pulled up to the ultimate reality, we see so many parts of creation. It's a great journey. We call it a spiritual journey because of the spectacular experiences we have, completely unimaginable experiences we have on this journey. So we call it journey. Actually, it's not a journey at all. We don't move anywhere. We don't go anywhere. The experience moves around us. We remain where we are. That consciousness in us, the totality of consciousness inside our head right now, never moves. It doesn't have any place to move. It's, it's beyond time and space. It creates time and space. Time and space move around it. Events move around it. And looks like we are moving around. We're driving a car. Are we moving? Or is the car and the universe around us is moving? We are not moving. The whole universe moves and we feel we are moving. You know that if you... If you're sitting in a car, next car starts moving without your knowing, you look at that, you think you're moving backwards. It's just a relative thing. This is the greatest relativeness that you can see when you never move, your consciousness never moves, there's no place to move, there's no place at all, there's no space. Their consciousness exists, it creates all this, and the whole show moves around. We think we are running around from place to place. So we call it a spiritual journey because of the spectacle in space and time that we encounter. Otherwise, it's a series of wakefulness, series of being awake. Supposing I, I once had a dream as a child that I had gone away from my body. <clears throat> I was sleeping somewhere and I'm having a dream so I moved away and I have to now run around and find where I'm sleeping. So I ran around and I 
found I was sitting in, in, in my bedroom. I said, there, there, there's my body. That's the real one. I went in and woke up. I then thought to myself, did I run somewhere actually? Or did the whole running took place while I was lying in the bed? Everything happened which I thought running from and away and back to the body was all while I'm still absolutely steady in the bed. I never went anywhere. The experience went everywhere. This is true at all levels. And we can only find this in reality if we go to that point where we wake up to the condition, where we find the whole experience created, ran around us. We never went anywhere. What happens when you ultimately wake up to your final true home? Do you say, thank God I've come here after a long journey? Or do you say, I was always here? It was just a set of dreams that I had. You will find you were always there. The whole creation took place there. Creation was nothing more than a series of experiences. And then you're back to where the experiences originated. The true home, the true place where you belong. What is the advantage of having all these experiences and then going back to our true home? Let us say the true home is not only one, but many, which also is an experience. In a true home, there's just one creative power, total soul, total totality of souls, and there are many souls. The one is experiencing the one and the many simultaneously. Let's think of it like that. The one is experiencing. It's an ocean with drops in the ocean. They never left the ocean. You can call it ocean, you can look at part of the ocean and a drop. Supposing it's that kind of a feature in our true home. Now, what are those separate drops saying to each other? Some of them have had this experience. Some souls have had this experience of coming right up to this physical plane, going through suffering, terrible experiences, pain and suffering, pain and pleasure, opposites. And many are sitting there, never had this experience. When we awake to the same level as they are, the other drops, other souls, we are dancing with joy because we know what the value of our own true home is. And they are also dancing, but listlessly, because they're dancing all the time. And they tell us, what's wrong with you? We are all in the same place. We are all in the same state of happiness and bliss. How are you dancing more than us? And we tell them, you don't know what you're missing. You've never seen anything beside this. We know what we've got. It's the same principle in consciousness that the appreciation in consciousness comes from experiencing the opposite of what we are trying to appreciate. If we have never seen that, we don't, don't appreciate. There was a guy recently in this country, a boy who committed some murders and he was let off by the judge that he was suffering from affluenza, what? not influenza. Affluence. He was too rich. He had never seen poverty, so he didn't know what riches was. So he did those things. Had he seen poverty, he wouldn't have done them. Now, this kind of thinking, but actually it is true. Supposing somebody has never seen pain, they'll never experience pleasure. If somebody has never seen unhappiness, they'll never know what happiness is. These experiences in consciousness come in these pairs of opposites. In our true home, there is no opposite. But we create a whole world of opposites and make it possible to experience even our true home as an opposite of what we created. This is a great cause for creation. What's the purpose of creation? That's a good purpose of creation. If you see the total grand picture of the creator and the creation, it's perfect. If you see a little part of it, it is imperfect. Therefore, if you, as seekers, are seeking the highest. Relax. Relax, you'll find the love you're looking for. It'll come from a human being like yourself. The difference will be only in the awareness of that human being and our own self. No other difference. That person will be ordinary like us, so ordinary that he can be a friend of us, so we can experience love at the same level, not worship somebody, not admire and adore somebody who's far away, not somebody who flies in the sky, not somebody sitting on a pedestal, somebody who's like us, whose hand we can shake, with whom we can talk, and have a strange confidence in that person because of that love that is flowing. That will happen automatically if you're a seeker. When that happens, 
control your mind, test him out to the extent necessary, but don't waste your entire life in testing. Test up to a point and take one step and build your experience upon that experience of the first step. Don't accept what he says as blind faith. See, is it worthwhile taking one step? If the one step is worthwhile, then take the second one. Have a living faith built on experience, not based upon what somebody says. That's blind faith. Have a living faith that grows like living things, that grows with each day's experience, and you will go to your true home. It's a guarantee. If you can do that, you are ready to go home. And if you don't know if you're ready, you take a chance, such a person can tell you if you're ready now or not. Most people can do, know themselves. People say, no, I am not ready. Or I have still to enjoy this life a little more. Or I am okay with what is going on. They are not ready. When you are ready, that person whom we call a perfect living master will be able to look at you and tell you you are ready. And he will accept you. Acceptance by such a person is called initiation by a perfect living master. And initiation guarantees, no matter what, the journey to a true home has started and will not end till you reach there. It's a guarantee. So that's why this whole system has been built up on this. We have arranged, we are part of the whole authorship of this whole creation and the creator. So I wish you the best of luck. I hope that you will take advantage of these opportunities that come to us. These are great opportunities. They don't come all the time. And perfect living masters come in our life. They are physical beings like ourselves. They are born, they live like us, they die. And that's an opportunity for us to take advantage while they are here. Afterwards, we just use our minds to figure out who they were. We start worshipping our own mind, thinking it's the master. Masters are gone. Mind does not say no, master can say no. Therefore, once you take advantage. There was a great mystic, Sheikh Farid. His master was Sheikh Kutmuddin. And Sheikh Farid wanted his son to get initiated by his master. He said, son, Kutmuddin is getting old. Take advantage. He might die. Then you will not get the chance. He's a living master. And the son, like most young people, said, dad, I have still to live my life. You know, I am, I am, whatever he was buying, like motor cars or something. There were no motor cars then, but he was like a young man. And he postponed. One day, Kutmuddin died. And he ran. And the initiation by Kutmuddin was you shave off your head and put your head on the feet of the master and ask for blessings. He shaved his head, put his head on the feet of the dead Kutmuddin's body. And Farid was standing there. He said, son, this is the body of a man I have worshipped and loved more than anything else in this life. But I must say, you can get nothing out of him now. He's not there. It's a dead body. Even one second is too late. I told you, take advantage of this. And he's gone. It's too late now. You can't get anything. You must get from a living person who can talk to you and who can tell you what to do. Who is like you. Therefore, take advantage. When these opportunities come, we should not miss the opportunity and wait for another life to come before we get a second opportunity. They don't come so often. I wish you all blessings. I hope you'll see you again next month. And I'll uh, break now. And there are a few people, some especially new people who are coming today. I'll meet them uh, one by one, personally. And if I can meet some of the older friends, I'll try to do that. But we'll finish this uh, interview by 5.15. So thank you very much for joining me today.